By now, most of us will have seen what are called trigonometric ratios, things like the idea of sine, cos and tan related to right angled triangles. What we're going to do now is move that on to something a little bit more useful, the concept of a trigonometric function. While you may already know about the trig ratios and the ratios of sides in a right angled triangle, trig functions allow us to model things that move sort of up and down in cyclic motions, things like perhaps the tides or perhaps electrical current and various other applications as well. But these do start in that same old familiar space of the trig ratios. So let's look at what we already know. We know that for a right angled triangle, that's one just like this, where one of the angles is a right angle or square angle, we know that sine, cos and tan of a particular angle in that triangle, not the right angle, let's call this one theta, those three sine, cos and tan values are given by ratios of different sides of the triangle. So if this were theta in the corner here, this is the opposite side, here is the adjacent, and here is the hypotenuse. The lengths of those can be divided and give us the values of sine of theta, cos of theta, and tan theta. Now you can imagine that these different values would change when you have differently shaped right angle triangles. So right triangles with very shallow angles theta, like this one, would have different sine, cos, and tan values to a triangle that looked more like this one. Because the sides opposite hypotenuse and adjacent would all have different lengths. Now imagine that we could tabulate those values for all different possible right angled triangles and all different theta values. We'd start to get a similar kind of idea to function values for sine or cos or tan of theta, whatever that theta might be. And that's exactly where we're going when we extend trig ratios for a single angle or for an angle into trig functions for any angle. By doing this, we'll be moving towards something, a function where we can plot, for example, the sine of theta against the different theta values as theta moves from say zero through one, two, three, as far as we want. And what we're gonna find is that we get, strangely enough, a sinusoidal curve. Something that's often useful is some specific exact trig function values that occur for certain particular angles or certain particular right triangles. And a whole bunch of these can be generated using what are called two standard triangles. These two that we can see here on the slide. This one here being called the 60-30 or pi on three, pi on six triangle. That refers to the size of those two angles. This one up the top here being pi on six, of course. And the other being the pi on four or 45 degree triangle. Now these triangles are special because those are pretty interesting or useful uh, angle values, 60, 30, and 45. They also have some reasonably interesting side values, one, one, and root two, and this other triangle, one, two, and root three. Now, what we can do is we can get this little table of exact values of the trig functions. Have a go at this yourself now by pausing the video and then trying to fill in the different spots on the table using the definitions of the trig ratios in the previous slide. Okay, so you should get some values like these ones that I've filled in for us. And just for an example, let's have a look at the sine of theta when theta is pi on six or 30 degrees. That comes from this standard triangle where pi on six is this angle up here. And if we want the sine of that angle, sine is given by the opposite side over the hypotenuse. The opposite side is one and the hypotenuse is two. So we have sine of that value equal to one on two. And the same thing applies for the rest of these. They're just some particularly useful, handy values that you might want to know. The way I do it is just to remember these standard triangles and how they work. And that lets me fill in the whole table. So we can use these ideas of the, the trig ratios to give us sine, cos and tan for any angles between zero and pi on two radians, or zero and 90 degrees, because they're defined in terms of the angles in a triangle. But how can we extend that out to angles outside of 90 degrees such as the kind of things we want to get on our sine curve here. How can we get outside of that triangle? What we're going to do now is try to find a definition that works exactly right and exactly correctly for what we already know, so that it gives us the same values as the triangles do, but also works for bigger angles. We're going to do that by using this diagram right here. On this circle, we can put this point P anywhere we like along there, 
in between the X and the Y positive axes and it'll generate a triangle like this one. A triangle where theta is between 0 and 90 degrees and we can get our values for the trig ratios of theta in the usual way, opposite over hypotenuse and so on. What we're going to want to do is try to figure out what happens if we move P all the way around to here or perhaps here or even here. How can we figure out our values then? So we're going to introduce some new definitions. These actually look very similar to what we already know, opposite over hypotenuse and so on. However, we're going to refer to them by these coordinate values, x, y, and r, being the distance from the origin to the point p. By defining sine, cos, and tan in this way, we're going to be able to extend our ideas so that we can look at angles such as this angle theta here, when p moves into this second quadrant or even an angle down here or over here in the fourth quadrant. By defining the trig functions in this way, we'll still get the same values whenever we've got an angle in the first quadrant from 0 to 90 degrees, but it'll also allow us to look at what the values are for sine, cos and tan when we're outside of the first quadrant. Let's take a look at this example that's going to ease us into things. Let's think about angles in the second quadrant of the Cartesian plane. Now that situation is given to us here in the diagram. So we're looking at angles theta, where theta takes us around into this region of the Cartesian plane, quadrant 2. Pause the video for a moment and write down whether the values of x, y and r, not z, are positive or negative. Then write down what you think the values of sine, cos and tan functions would be. Will they be positive or negative? Okay. So we should be able to see that x is sitting over here to the left of the origin. So in quadrant 2, x is going to be negative. y is always going to be up high here, so y is going to be positive. And r, that angle or that line length there, is always given by the square root of x squared plus y squared. It's always going to be positive, in fact, no matter what quadrant we're in, not just q2. So now we should be able to use our new definitions for sine, cos and tan of theta to figure out if those are going to be positive or negative. Have a go at that too. Okay, so given our ratios defined, or our functions now, defined in this way, we'll find that sine of theta, which is y on r, must be a positive over a positive or positive. Cos theta, x on r is negative, and tan theta is negative as well. What we can actually do is repeat this exercise for all of the quadrants. And what we can find then is what's called, or often referred to as the cast diagram. And the cast diagram just tells us that in quadrant 1, all three of the trig ratios are positive, A for all. In quadrant 2, only sine S is positive, as we've just found. In quadrant 3, it's just tan. And finally, in quadrant 4, only cos is positive. It's just a useful little tool that you can use to remember whether you've got a positive or a negative trig value in the different quadrants. So what about actually figuring out what these values are? It might seem like it's going to be a bit tricky, but really it's not. All we're going to do is use the same old values that we'd figure out for a regular right angled triangle in the first quadrant, cos theta being x over r, sine theta y over r, and so on. But we can extend them with slight little tweaks to all of the other quadrants as well. The key to this is identifying a different angle, a reference angle. So if we're looking for an angle theta, which is in quadrant 2, and we want its cos, sine, and tan values, what we need to do is figure out what's the reference angle, alpha, that brings us around to 180 degrees, or pi, pi radians. Well, essentially, it's just 180 minus theta, or pi minus theta. And that little angle, alpha, will allow us to easily figure out what our cos, sine, and tan will be. So you can see here, cos of theta, when we're in the second quadrant, will be minus the cos of alpha, the reference angle. Sine of theta will be the same as sine of alpha, and tan theta will be minus tan alpha. Similar relationships can be figured out for the other quadrants, Q3 and Q4 as well. You should have a go at some of those when you try the worksheets after this video. So that is where to go to now. Attempt some of those exercises. Make sure that you can figure out those values for yourself, and also using your calculator or a computer. As usual, write down in your notebook any questions you might have, Make sure you're adding items to your cheat sheet. Something a little bit extra, 
why do you think we'd even want these trigonometric functions anyway? I've hinted at a little bit, but maybe think about what it might be useful for. And in terms of the kind of things that you're interested in, in science or physics, or perhaps in engineering, think about where you might use trigonometric functions and what they might look like.